Peter Kowalczyk had a, uh, a long and distinguished career with uh, Placer Dome, spending many years as the chief geophysicist until the end of Placer. <clears throat> um, after that, he uh, got into many different things, but um, one of them, which was uh, diving into, no pun intended, seafloor exploration. So, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I just realized I should probably explain that ROVs are remotely operated vehicles. So they're uh, unmanned submarines that you drive from the surface through an umbilical cable. They're tethered vehicles. And AUVs are autonomous underwater vehicles. So these are smart torpedoes that you put over the side and they go away and they come back a day later. So just to uh, give, some, give you some clarity there. Um, in seafloor exploration, the principal minerals of economic interest are submarine massive sulfides, which are copper, gold, and zinc, manganese nodules, uh, which are manganese with uh, uh, values in nickel and cobalt, and uh, some rare earths, and gas hydrates, which is uh, seafloor methane, uh, fixed as a, uh, it's a, they call it uh, fire and ice, it's a frozen methane sitting in the, in the seafloor in a, in a clathrate. And there also, there's um, value in diamonds, manganese crusts, and phosphate fertilizer. I put this map up because uh, actually one of the big drivers of technology for seafloor exploration is Japan. It's an island nation, a seafaring nation, and they have a strategic national objective to enable seafloor mining. They're spending hundreds of millions of dollars to establish the technology. And their present plans are uh, to do trial mining of submarine massive sulfides in this year, 2017. They've done that. Uh, they are, have an active gas hydrate exploration program with the intention of being able to uh, exploit gas hydrates if they need to. And they are doing exploration for manganese crusts and nodules, I think uh, partly to ensure a supply of rare earths uh, as the present supply comes from China. So why are SMS deposits attractive? Well, there's always be a demand for metals. And uh, on land, new deposits are hard to find. They're difficult to permit and typically takes 10 years or more to bring a deposit to production. At sea, SMS deposits are, their grades are high and uh, particularly copper and gold. New deposits are being found at a high rate. These are not large deposits, but they are being discovered on every cruise. And the cost structure is different. Um, they're being mined by robots, which is, I think is, is really important. Uh, the infrastructure uh, design is standardized and modular. The time to production is accelerated. And you don't have sunk costs. That when you build a seafloor mining system, you can move it around. So you can sequence your mining of uh, high-grade seafloor deposits to optimize your cash flow. And when you've mined one, you just move to the next. So it's unlike... Um, the mine in the Andes, uh, where when you've uh, mined it out or if metal prices fall, uh, you basically have a large uh, and expensive infrastructure that you have to decommission. And I don't think people really uh, realize how much exploration has been going on. That we've participated in more than 20 mineral exploration cruises up to three months duration since 2007. Every year, there's been other ships and exploration teams at sea, and they've been funded privately by governments and by government-backed consortiums. And the work is actually motivated by a desire to start mining. It's not academically motivated, although there is a strong academic component uh, mixed into it. Um, submarine massive sulfide deposits are associated with uh, seafloor spreading and um, the back arc uh, areas, and uh, just uh, you can see they exist all around the world. This is an active database of uh, known vent fields, and the uh, deposits are associated with hydrothermal venting. So that's where Nautilus Minerals has their uh, deposit in, in Papua New Guinea. Um, Japanese effort is mainly focused for submarine massive sulfides in the Okinawa back arc. Um, the Norwegians have just started exploration uh, of uh, their um, assets in the Barents Sea. 
Uh, Europeans have been working on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the tag deposits particularly, although they've been uh, working all along it. Um, and the uh, Germans have been, and Chinese, I think, have been working in the uh, uh, Indian Ocean triple point. Uh, so these are, these are active projects going on, and uh, there are ships at sea uh, on a fairly regular basis. So if you want to look for a hydrothermal field, the easiest way to find out if you're close to one is to uh, look for the um, plume from the vents. And it's kind of the best analogy to this would be flying around the IFR in a helicopter with your head out the window trying to smell a pulp mill. That uh, you, can, you can tell when you're close to them, but you don't know exactly where you are. But it's a very distinctive signature. Uh, there's a turbidity anomaly, and um, so when you... Uh, when you pass through the plume, you see an increase in, uh, in turbidity that the uh, optical transmissivity falls. There's also a chemical anomaly, and uh, you have manganese water chemistry anomaly is very obvious but also methane, which you have methane sensors that you can detect this, and so you can tell when you're in a plume, and uh, so the system's called a, a TOYO, and basically you have an automated winch, which is winding up and then dropping down, and winding up and dropping down, so that as your ship sails along, you're taking a sample of the water column all the time. When you detect it, you might be in a plume, you can take a water sample, you've got bottles, and then at the end of it, you bring up your bottles and you do the chemistry. Once you uh, want to explore an area, sonar is the, uh, the tool that you would use. And synthetic aperture sonar is a new type of sonar which is extremely good and has very high precision. Uh, I'm just, uh, if you look at this rope, okay, lying on the seafloor, this is a sonar image. It looks like a photograph. And it's 85 meters range. So synthetic aperture sonar has a resolution well, about two centimeters at 200 meters. So when you uh, are collecting a swath, 200 meters wide swath on each side of your AUV, that's 10,000 pixels on one side and 10,000 pixels on the other side. So you can compare that to with, say, airborne scanners, and you can see that this is a huge amount of data that you're acquiring at very high resolution. Um, this is a mosaic of synthetic aperture sonar that was collected uh, by Alden Denny in exploration in Norway, Norwegian waters. Um, there's two uh, vent systems here that you can detect fairly easily. You can see them, but uh, at this scale, it looks like an air photo, but you can zoom in to the scale of the previous photo that I showed you where you were looking at a rope. And uh, this is something that can be interpreted, and uh, you can see the uh, you, you can see the, the vents and the morphology of submarine massive sulfites. Just uh, another example, the, the largest uh, field that's been discovered in, in uh, Japan was discovered more or less serendipitously. Uh, the Japanese Coast Guard has a responsibility for monitoring submarine volcanoes. So they came on this, uh, this caldera. And uh, so using the shipborne bathymetry, uh, shipborne multi-beam system, they mapped out this caldera and they had a volcano here. So they put an AUV over the side to uh, map it. In two days, this was one day's dive, this was the other day's dive, they produced this image of the bottom of the caldera. Here's the uh, conical features that's associated with the, with the volcano, and uh, you can see all these mounds. And here's actually a, a zoomed in image of, uh, not mounds, but well they are, they're hydrothermal mounds and chimneys. So, Uh, it's, not, it's not exaggerated, it's one-to-one. -one. This is a, just a, a, a slice through one of these. So here, this is the multi-beam image uh, from two passes, looking one way and looking the other way. You have a chimney that's about 23 meters high. The mound is about 10 meters high. This mound is about 20 meters across. If you do a really rough estimate, you come up with a tonnage perhaps of 7,500 tons. So 1,000 ton a day per mine, you'd keep that running for about a, day, a week on that particular chimney. So a useful thing is magnetometers. Um, 2008, we were putting magnetometers on ROVs, and um, 
thing about a mag is that, uh, you know, it's fairly expensive to put a vehicle on the seafloor, so you can't do just magnetics. What you want to do is to do magnetics when you're doing other things. So here are these uh, two uh, sort of beetle brows that we have up here have the magnetometers, so they're put on the ROV. The big problem uh, is, is not the sensitivity of the mags, uh, it's compensation for the vehicle they're on. And uh, so the image, the image, this image was collected in 2008 with the ROV. Uh, we basically kept the ROV on a constant heading, so, and then we leveled the, uh, the two directions manually to produce the image. It's a pretty good image. But since then, we have developed a self-compensating magnetometer that uh, allows us to uh, buck out the uh, vehicle heading errors and vehicle attitude errors. This is the raw data. Here we've got about uh, 2,500 nanoteslas of uh, vehicle heading error. So it's very hard to see anything in this data if you just have the raw data. After we've done the compensation, you get a nice magnetic map, 25 nanotesla contours. We've reduced the heading error to a bit less than five nanoteslas. And this vehicle was doing its normal business and collecting magnetic data at the same time. This is an image uh, collected over the uh, Endeavour field uh, off uh, Vancouver Island by Abe, which is a Woods Hole vehicle, and uh, its magnetics, which has been painted onto the seafloor uh, bathymetry. So uh, the interesting thing are these lows, because they're actually associated with magnetite destruction where the submarine massive sulfides are. And um, this is fairly typical. You see this in a lot of fields. Uh, uh, you, the mag is fairly simple because it's uh, the, uh, the, the, the basalts, that have, volcanics that have come up, and uh, then you get destruction of magnetite where you have the uh, hydrothermal fluids coming up to the seafloor massive sulfides. And just uh, if you do a magnetic inversion uh, and uh, look at the likely shape of the uh, susceptibility uh, below, here's where this a slice showing where the submarine massive sulfides are on surface. And here's um, the feeder zone, lower susceptibility uh, coming up to the submarine massive sulfides. So the strength of this mag low is actually a, kind of a proxy for the amount of fluid that's flowed and it's a way of ranking your targets. The other thing about massive sulfides is that um, they're conductors. Uh, this is a, con a model of, of them, and so you should be able to use EM. And this looks like an airborne EM system, except it's being towed over the seafloor. The anomalies are clear, and uh, you can, uh, these systems are now detecting uh, conductors to depths of about 30 meters, or perhaps a bit more. We've developed an EM system that allows us to do EM with an AUV, and this means that you can do all the normal things you do with an AUV, but at the same time um, do EM and look for buried uh, conductors or to rank uh, mounds based on the conductivity targets associated with them. We put a transmitter on the seafloor, and then the AUV tracks around and measures the electric fields. So that's a CSCM system. Uh, here's a study we did to show that it worked. This is the bathymetry from the AUV that was collected while the AUV was doing its work. And uh, this is the apparent resistivity, showing that uh, you do have some conductivity over here. We have since inverted that, and it shows that there's compact conductors uh, below the mounds, and that's a good sign that you have uh, a submarine massive sulfide body here. There are other signs, but it's, it's a very uh, useful method because it's done while everything else is done, and it uh, takes you to the stage of ranking targets for drilling. One other thing which is very interesting is the SP, that because we did three component electric field measurements, we're able to show the direction of the SP fields, and uh, it's a very well-organized and repeatable measurement. Here you can see that uh, these have currents are flowing away from something in this region. And uh, we're able to show that we have strong SP anomaly here and here. And it's very likely associated with the actual hydrothermal venting and the emission of hot fluids in the seafloor. 
Gravity is a useful tool. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to do. Originally, this survey over the tag mound in the Atlantic was done using a gravimeter between the knees of an operator in this submersible, uh, which is not the way to go forward. But um, yeah, this shows the gravity. The, the straight line is the uh, free water correction. Uh, here you have the anomaly due to the mass of sulfides, about 0.8 milligals, very straightforward to measure. And the excess mass from this is about 3 million tons, which just gives you great comfort because that's about what you thought you had there. Um, Japanese have now built a hopping AUV that can land on the seafloor and uh, take gravity. Uh, it's a small AUV, you can see it on the right, and uh, in it there's a self-leveling gra gravimeter. So when you had a shift at sea, you can put this over the side and it can do a gravity survey while you're doing something else. Seismic works. Uh, vertical cable seismic is a low impact system. You, put the, you can operate it from a small ship. So you put the uh, geophone strings over the side, they're floating in a vertical array. You truck around on the surface with the uh, source and you can build a 3D cube. And actually, it, uh, here's a buried mound. This is where the EM anomaly was also. Here's the base of another mound, and uh, you can get a great deal of information from a seismic cube like this. It actually works well, and if you take slices through it, the mounds show up as circular features. You've got an ROV on the bottom. It's got cameras going all the time, so you need to build an image database. If you take this, the upper left is the image database collected from the ROV, but it's accessible in an in interactive way, so you can zoom in. You see something of interest there, you can zoom in again. Interactively, you zoom in again. And so the top upper left, you've got the entire prospect of it in your image database, and interactively, you can zoom down to a crab. And uh, there's a lot of data in that, but if you've acquired the imagery, you want to be able to investigate it. So manganese nodules, why are they attractive? Well, there's lots of them, and they have value in uh, manganese, nickel, cobalt, and rare earths. Technology's been demonstrated. Just a picture to show you, this Mexico in the upper right, Hawaii in the upper left. These are the claims for manganese nodules. There's been exploration uh, over these claims. We had a ship at sea for six weeks this year uh, working on them. Uh, the Japanese are currently working on them. There's other uh, ships working on them. So this is an ongoing uh, current exploration effort. Gas hydrates, why are gas hydrates important? Well, the undiscovered natural gas can reserves are thought to be about something in the order of uh, 13,000 trillion cubic feet. Global reserves of gas hydrates are quite a bit bigger, and it's not clear what they are, but it's some, some number between 100,000 trillion cubic feet to 300,000, no, I'm sorry, that's a bigger number, anyway, <laughs> a trillion cubic feet. And so Japan is very interested because they have gas hydrate reserves, and um, they buy all their gas overseas, and they want to be able to use their ability to develop their own reserves as a backstop against their commercial purchase of gas hydrates elsewhere in the world. Um, in the left, you can see uh, a production test in 2010. They've done one again. Uh, they've been looking at the bottom of the gas hydrate stability zone. Gas hydrate's interesting. Uh, it occurs... Uh, in the seafloor to a depth of about 200 to 400 meters. And the reason it doesn't occur deeper is that the geothermal gradient takes you outside of the stability zone. So at the bottom of the stability zone, you get a reflector which cross-cuts all the others in a seismic section. It's called the bottom simulating reflector. And um, so the gas hydrate stability zone is from the BSR to the seafloor. Generally, you don't find it in less than 600 meters of water. So that was their test. but. Recently, they've discovered, or it's been discovered, that um, these mounds of gas hydrate, which occur on the seafloor, which are usually associated with uh, venting, actually are part of quite large deposits. And so um, you can map those using controlled source CM. I've put the BSR on there as a white line. And um, above the BSR, the blue areas are uh, probably gas hydrate zones, uh, here that's probably a vent, okay, that they probably have methane venting there, you probably have methane venting there. This is the region that's 
stable for gas hydrates. This is probably a gas hydrate. These are probably gas. So that's probably gas, that's probably gas, gas, gas hydrate. And here you have a methane vent with the opportunity for gas hydrates close to surface. A good way to map that's with the Vulcan CSEM system, and this is rather like a complex resistivity system, only adapted to oceans. So you've got a ship with power and winches and uh, transmitter controllers. It's transmitting power down to a transmitter, which you're towing 50 meters off the seafloor. You have a current dipole, so this is transmitting some number between, well, I think, um, EMGS has just announced a 10,000 ampere transmitter. We operate 100 to 400 ampere transmitter. And then you have uh, E-field receivers following behind, and uh, you're measuring the electric field from that, uh, the complex electric field from a very well-controlled multi-frequency uh, transmission from the current dipole at the front. So there's a picture of a Vulcan going uh, at sea. Transmitter going over the back. You can see the two electrodes uh, behind the transmitter. And uh, this is an inversion. Uh, we've been doing 3D inversions. They've worked really well. Uh, the big surprise over the last few years, again, has been that these inversions have produced quite large resistivity anomalies, which people have argued about. They said it's not reasonable. Well, now they've drilled them, and they found actually they're real that uh, these numbers that have come out of the electrical inversions are being supported by drill core. And so uh, these bodies of gas hydrate of substantial size close to the seafloor are, uh, are now uh, 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 something of real interest. So seafloor exploration since 2007, what's happened? New equipment has been built and tested and best practices have been established Start off with shipborne bathymetry and water chemistry, follow with AUV mapping and ore resource definition, sonar multi-beam magnetometry, electromagnetics, self-potential, gravity. These are all tested working commercial systems. ROV sampling and video. Localized high-resolution seismic. You can produce a 3D seismic cube with a small ship uh, and uh, pretty low logistics costs. And then drilling, seafloor drills. This is a picture of a seafloor drill built in Burnaby. There's been two of these shipped out from the shop next to us. Um, it's a wireline coring system, and uh, it's designed to uh, put on the seafloor and drill holes, and it works, um, and it's been used. This is a picture of the machinery that Nautilus Minerals has built uh, for scale. You can see a couple of people standing here. Okay, and uh, so this is intended to be used when the start production in 2019, uh, which are their current plans. They've been beaten by the Japanese who announced that they had done a test last month. And this is the Japanese system, test system, doing test mining on the seafloor. So, and they have crushed that on the seafloor and then they have piped it to the surface. So they have demonstrated that they can mine and transport high grade ore from the SMS deposits to the surface. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Very interesting talk. The, t the time is officially up, so people want to move out to the coffee break, but we can take a couple of questions for those who would like to. If you do have any questions, please come and ask me. I'd be very pleased to expand. I have a lot of slides I removed from that presentation. <laughs> I have one about the uh, chemistry because uh, groundwater hydrogeochemistry is really complicated in terms of correcting for stuff like salinity and uh, pH and stuff like that. But in the in the ocean, I guess it's all quite constant and simple. Or the oceans are pretty pretty standard medium, yeah. Mm -hmm. And dilutions are it's pretty high. So I mean, clearly, if you're sampling a vent, it's it's different. But or once you're ten meters from it, yeah. uh, you're back to the ocean. All right, thank you. Thanks to all the speakers for this session. Enjoy the rest of the conference.